This episode is sponsored by Bow Lake, the most beautiful paddle boards in the world. Visit bowlake.com and learn more. That's B E A U lake.com. Bow is French for beautiful. B E A U lake.com. You're listening to The Luxury Item, the podcast on the business of luxury and the people and companies that are shaping the future of the luxury industry. Here's your host, Scott Kerr. Nestled in the heart of Napa Valley, California, one of the world's most renowned wine regions just north of San Francisco is Palmaz Vineyards. This renowned winery is proudly owned and operated by two generations of a family that has brought cutting-edge technology, creativity, and hospitality to the culture of wine and the time-honored art of winemaking. Palmaz Vineyard stands out for its wines and its unique site, which includes an 18-story high subterranean winery where its wines are produced using novel technologies and state-of-the-art equipment. Palmaz Vineyards produces some of the region's finest wines, and often finds itself on a best wine or a top vineyard to visit Napa Valley list. My guest on the luxury item is Christian Palmaz, Chief Operating Officer of Palmaz Vineyards. Christian is son of Palmaz Vineyards co-founders Julio and Amalia Palmaz and plays a key role in the creative team behind the wines. Christian is recognized in the industry for having created unique, highly sophisticated applications to improve vineyard management. Additionally, Christian is the president and CEO of material science company, Vectronic Scientific. Welcome to the luxury item, Christian. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, Palmaz Vineyards was founded by your father, Dr. Julio Palmaz, who spent most of his career in medicine as an international radiologist and gained notoriety for inventing the first cardiovascular stent and found his way into the world of winemaking. I'd like you to share the story of the family's fascinating journey into the wine world. You know, it, it really started out here in California, you know, when my father was, uh, you know, doing his residency, he was at UC Davis, uh, you know, twice a week, he was working at the VA hospital. And then the rest of his time, it was, so they were living in Martinez and the weekends were dominated by Napa, right? So they fell in love with, with this place. My dad had this uh, white Triumph Spitfire <laughs> and, you know, they would drive up and down the valley on the weekends, visiting their favorite wineries. I mean, doing the Napa Valley thing, uh, you know, the same way it's done today, uh, a little bit different, right? A little, there were, there were you know, more family owned wineries as it was, a, it was more of a, uh, of a unique feel as it, it was kind of the, the heyday back then it was, it was lovely. And, um, but it, it, this place obviously left a, you know, mark on them for sure. So with this large parcel of land as a blank canvas, what was the vision for the winery aside from making good wine? You know, many years later, after, you know, the stent was uh, well underway uh, for its commercial effort, my parents, I guess, had, you know, for the first time in their lives, they had a kind of an opportunity to focus on something that they truly were passionate for. and and you know napa valley came calling and they found this this really remarkable property uh you know now we look back and and we realize how unique these properties are there's not many of them left that retained 100 percent of its pre-prohibition acreage but that's what this place was right it was this untouched gem that was a uh, once upon a time winery you know pre-prohibition founded by a man named henry hagan 640 acres spanning three different elevations of vineyards and had not been touched for 77 years in terms of an agricultural operation. And so it was, it was the perfect place to, to, to come and start a new, again, a a estate based uh, wine project. Did he know what kind of products to produce and what kind of winery business it was going to be? Well, no, I don't think we had a crystal ball, but at the same time, we, you know, we were, you know, they were trying the wines of the region and Coombsville was, was, uh, you know, was already well established on the map of producing these beautiful, uh, you know, a little bit cooler climate. We have a little more relief from that, that, uh, kind of North Bay, uh, a little cooler wind. So we have, we have, it's a little bit different than say Rutherford or a little bit up North. So the property was going to make the wines that i think the property needed to make and i think the 
the best thing that they could do was approach it from what does the terroir want to make? And I think, mm-hmm. you know, many times we, we may come into these um, wine projects with a preconceived notion of what the wines we want to make are. But I think it's really important to realize that the land wants to make us a certain kind of wine and, and, and your role as the winemaker or the, or the visionary behind the product is really to uh, sort of enable the land to do that and, and, and not try to fight it with a lot of in, you know, in improved style or in, in, or trying to, you know, sort of push the wine one way or the other. Can you talk a little bit about your role as chief operating officer of Palmaz Vineyards? Yeah, so in my role, uh, you know, I, I, the way I think about it is I play a supporting role to those who have the talent, right? So I get to work with some of the, you know, absolute greatest people uh, in the world. Uh, everyone here, absolutely at the tops of their careers. Obviously, Mia Klein, Tina Mitchell, uh, Doug Mitchell, our, our seller master, Pablo Diaz, you know, these, every one of these people have, have been doing this for 30 plus years, right? And they have a, an incredible uh, a professional approach. My role is really to provide them the place, the facility, and, and the conduit for their ideas, for, the, for the, the wines to truly be made in the vineyard and then translated in the winery. So, you know, I get to operate uh, and, and develop probably one of the coolest wineries ever built. Other members of your family contribute to the process as well. So what are their skills and their roles in this family affair? Absolutely. Well, you know, so it's, it's, it's very much a three generations uh, on property, of course, you know, mom and dad, and then, uh, you know, us three kids with the three kids really being my sister and I, plus my wife, my, uh, my wife, Jessica is the president of the winery. So she runs the, she runs the show. Um, my sister, uh, acts as, uh, as CEO and, uh, very much has, you know, hands in, in every part of it also, you know, really acts as our kind of stylistic director, um, works very closely with me and Tina on the blends. And then I do all the, the operation stuff, you know, making sure that the facility is operating correctly, that the viticultural program is being executed, you know, uh, to the winemaking wishes. And so we work, we work quite well. And, you know, of course we all, we're looking to the third generation, which is, uh, you know, coming up and, uh, uh, you know, up and coming here in the next, uh, decade or so. One of the many remarkable feats of engineering I keep reading about at Palmaz Vineyards is the 100,000 square foot, 18 story underground winery called the Cave, which is really the heart of Palmaz's winemaking operations. Can you explain what the Cave is and why it's considered an engineering marvel? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really an amazing building. Uh, aside from all the amazing winemaking it does, uh, the structure was envisioned really for three design principles. So the first design principle was you had 64 acres spanning three different elevations, lots of different soil types, microclimates, lots of different reasons to keep things separate through the winemaking process. So what do you want as a winemaker? You know, what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal, in in my opinion, you know, if you think about winemaking as uh, like painting a painting, you know, so if at the end of the process, you know, guys like me, we make paint, we make the, we make the color red, the color yellow, the color blue. Our job is to translate these ingredients to the winemaker so that they can sit down at a blending table two years later. So what they don't like is when we, you know, sort of do parts of their job for them, right? When we make decisions, uh, because the process makes decisions for them where we start to pre-blend components together because the winery is was designed to do that. In this case, imagine designing a facility that would take each terroir, each little parcel in the vineyard and maintain it separate, not just through fermentation, but all the way through barrel aging so that you could sit down at the end of a two-year process and have the individual barrel ingredient representing the free run or the press of that single parcel all kept separate so that you can interpret it and then design, blend the best wines you can. So the winery was designed to keep separate the 24 unique parcels that live across these three elevations of vineyards. Of course, we have all five Bordeaux. We also have a whites program with three whites. We have a little bit of Grenache as well. So 
that was sort of the first design principle. The second one was that we were going to do all of this under a gravity flow concept. So gravity flow became a really hot button topic uh, in the in the late uh, late eighties um, when we began to understand the molecular delicate uh, nature of wine, particularly in the tannins and the way they polymerize, and it really affects the wines. Uh, 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 aging characteristics and how important it, it became to be as gentle with the wine as possible during the winemaking process. So as was very popular in the early 90s was to design wineries that were as gentle as possible, this would take that to the next level. So not just being a gravity flow facility, but also being able to gravity filter and bottle. So, you know, folks around here like to call that gravity finished wines. So the unique factor there is that the facility is a, the elevator shaft is about 220 feet tall, uh, 18 stories of which are underground. And that gives us not just the height needed to make the wine, but also the requisite height left over at one atmosphere to be able to filter and bottle the wines in, in one pass, meaning that you don't have to use pumps or any aggressive movements. And then the last design feature that really defined this, on, uh, you know, uh, it was the fact that the winery was a net zero water consumptive structure. So we were one of the first wineries approved by the California state and, and county uh, to be operated under a net zero water consumption, uh, which is immensely important, you know, as we've gone through drought eras in California, uh, the winery's ability to conserve 100% of the water it uses, treat it back to uh, a very, very high standard uh, using uh, uh, non-salt-based components is really fantastic. It's all aer aer aerobic, organic, fil uh, digestive filtration systems that were developed for us. Uh, and the winery treats all of its water back and then stores it in a tunnel that's three city blocks long. So about 1.7 million gallons of water gets treated back and then used towards irrigation the following year. Since its early days, Palmas Vineyards has been at the forefront of innovative vineyard and winery technology and is continuing to upgrade and improve its processes. Many of those innovations have your thumbprint on it. It helps that you studied computer science and geoscience along with your business degree. What are some of the more interesting programs and smart systems you've implemented to improve the winemaking process? So there's really, there's really two that come to mind um, that have definitely changed the way we think about winemaking uh, forever. And you know, the first one starts in the vineyard. Uh, it's called VIGOR, uh, kind of a bad acronym, but it stands for Vineyard Infrared Growth Optical Recognition. Uh, VIGOR is an airplane. Uh, so it's an airplane that goes up in the sky twice a week, takes a, an infrared picture or wide spectrum infrared picture of the vines from about 8,000, 9,000 feet in the, in the air. And that picture measures the amount of uh, uh, basically chlorophyll in the leaves. So using the sun as the light bulb in the sky, we can actually measure how much uh, infrared light is reflected off the leaves of the vines. And that tells you with a very high accuracy how vigorous the plant is, how what is its metabolic state uh, at that given point in time. And then you, what you do is you study that, you correlate that information to soil moisture. And so what you're looking for is slight variations why maybe one vine in in a sink within a parcel is growing a little bit faster than the other vine nearby or or maybe across the uh, across the, the the field and and what we do is instead of sort of the low tech approach of of irrigating assuming that all the vines need the same amount of water we actually adjust the amount of water that every vine receives to help normalize uh, that difference in 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 the in what we call the vegetative index. And so the idea is at the end of the year, if you keep doing this week after week after week, by the time you, the winemaker, walk down the row and you're tasting that fruit, you should be rewarded by having more even ripeness, right? Because when we pick the parcel, we pick the entire parcel. We don't go and pick every 11th vine or 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 only this section. We really need the parcel to ripen together. And yes, although the you know these modern vineyards have excellent you know geological understanding, soil uh, considerations for hydrology and all these things, there's no such thing as homogeneous soil. And so using these tools not only allow us to improve uh, the water, you know, uh, reduce water consumption by not you know watering the lowest common denominator, but more importantly, allowing the vines to be farmed individually right? Accepting the fact that they're all individual plants, they have individual root systems, they have individual uh, behaviors, and they each need an individual farming plan. And so this 
uh, sort of macro data analytics tool that we use with Figure helps us do a very, very fine control irrigation and has the, you know, the benefit of, of, uh, of uh, saving a ton of water, right? So roughly about, uh, we calculate about 23% water reduction uh, since Figure came online. So it wow. really helps improve the quality of the vines, but also, uh, to, you know, uh, preserve our most precious resource, which is water. Second one is Felix. So Felix is uh, a, call it a, uh, sort of an AI winemaker assistant. Um, it was developed, you know, it's funny, we we use the word AI now for everything. And and uh, I, I, since I developed this software, uh, AI has, <laughs> now we have uh, chat GPT and all. This is really a machine learning tool. Um, so it doesn't talk to you. It doesn't have a personality, thank God. <laughs> but what it does uh, is it, it, it studies the way that fermentation health is 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 undergoing in the tank. So using a probe called a sonodensitometer, we measure the speed of sound inside the tank uh, 10 times a second. And so with that, we know the density of the wine very, very accurately, similar to the way a winemaker would be measuring periodically the, the old technique of using a hydrometer to of course measure the brick. So now that Felix knows the rate of fermentation, it's able to apply heating and cooling at exactly the right moments so that fermentation can undergo at the at the pace that the winemaker wants. So what this does, so when you know, imagine a room with 24 simultaneous fermenting fermenters, right? You, the winemakers wanted to have that terroir level separation of the vineyard, fantastic, but it comes at the expense of having to spread your limited attention uh, to detail uh, across a lot more, uh, you know, uh, fermenters. And so the idea was. You know, getting again, getting to work with these incredible people, you know, Tina Mitchell, you work with people like them, you very realize very quickly that what makes them them and, and has their has really nothing to do with things you can put numbers to, right? The things you can put numbers to, like the rate of fermentation, the exothermic reaction, all the things, the oxygen take up, all these things that make up a healthy fermentation really have nothing to do with the stylistic direction or that incredible moment that that extraction, that thing you can see, smell, taste, or feel appears and you have a suddenly new idea. So the idea was, could we build a system that allowed the winemaker to spend more of their time being human, right? Actually elevating the human element of wine and allowing the system to focus on all the mundane details that keep you up at night related to that really kind of hold you back from taking more risks or being more daring, right? So it gives you that situational awareness to know what's happening with the fermenter, but additionally, it allows you to be uh, a little more bold and, and, and the results are healthier fermentations, less mistakes, and, and, and more exciting uh, uh, extractions uh, and, and, and opportunities that happen during fermentation. Speaking of artificial intelligence, we're seeing AI playing a more important role with winemakers. I was reading the other day about this AI-powered tool that helps wineries and retailers understand which consumers are going to like which wines. It uses proprietary algorithms to understand what wine drinkers will like and then provide accurate recommendations. It predicts how it's going to taste, smell, and feel to a human palate. Since the wine industry is so steeped in tradition, it's typically been averse to adopting this type of technology for fear it eliminates the romance in winemaking. What are your thoughts? That was, you know, when we when we rolled out Felix the first year in um, in 2015, um, I gave a talk at the uh, Cabernet Symposium uh, to my peers, right, and to a bunch of other winemakers. And uh, you're right. People were concerned. People didn't understand the, the full intention. Were we trying to eliminate the winemaker? Was this a step, the first step towards not ever needing a winemaker again? And, and actually, I think it, it took a little bit of uh, time to realize and, and, and show how incredibly important that human element is in wine. And so, you know, I think we as, as humans do things part very, very well in certain, certain aspects, but we don't do things very well. You know, we have to sleep, we have to eat, we, we get fatigued. We, uh, uh, you know, we, we get sick and, and, and things can happen to us. Um, and there's things about fermentation that are very black and white, right? There's, there's a, 
there's you know there's a chem there's a biological process where we convert available sugar to alcohol there's extractions there's uh enzymatic reactions that are occurring all these things that are happening um we definitely know when things are going well and when they're not going well we know when there's an oxygen deficiency in the tank for example but there's a whole bunch of things that we that we don't really have you know besides you know phenolic understandings and very you know advanced expressions the human is so good at understanding and recognizing that stylistic direction that that feels good that tastes good that has that artistic expression and it's i think what we found is that it's more important to help the human do the human job uh and 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 allow them to be sort of relieved from the the sort of the the dumb boring and and repetitive and I think that's where Felix really made a big difference. It helped us see the problems before they were happening. Um, and so just from a quality standpoint, uh, quality control standpoint, Felix had that that impact. And 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 the result, you know, here we, you know, we've we've been working with Felix now for uh, uh almost eight years. Uh the breadth of data and the knowledge and the refinement of the technology has has now entered a new era. And it really, it allows Tina and Mia to, to have a comfort level to push themselves into, you know, taking risks and having a little more, be more daring, being more bold, things that they may not have tried, you know, a, a decade ago. I want to talk about the brand. At what point did the Palmas brand strategy start falling into place where you looked at your story, your people, your land? and your wines and define your identity? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it happened overnight. It kind of developed slowly. Uh, it's funny, we, we just recently sat down with the whole team, the whole almost uh, the whole marketing team, the, the winemaking team, and, and we tasted through, we, we did this, my, my mother put on this beautiful dinner and, and we tasted through every wine we've ever made, right? All the way back to, to 2001. And um, it's amazing to see not just the evolution of the wines, but also the the actual the similarities between them. That it it takes it takes two decades of making wines, I think, to to sort of look back and say, "Wow, this all came from the same place," and 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 I can tell that it came from the same place. And, uh, and, and, and yes, in this era, the wines were made by the same people, right. Uh, and, and, and in the same facility by the same grapes and, and, and there's something wonderful about that, but also, you know, that you see personalities in, in some vintages over others. So from a, from a brand perspective, I think what we've done well is we have stuck to our guns. We've, we haven't really evolved the concept away from the original goal, which was develop a property, make a wine that comes from a place, right? Made by, you know, by, by very, very talented people in a, in a facility that holds nothing back and everything is done to the same level every single year. And it has this sort of forever feel to it. And I think our customers as they get to know us and they get to know the brand and they come back every year and they and they they put another bottle in their cellar representing another vintage i think they also see that and i think that's what really ended up defining the brand it wasn't a, a brand direction it wasn't it was just time and i think there's nothing like time in this industry that allows things to develop themselves and and i truly believe this if you just stick to your guns and you make a good product uh, that, that, you know, you can be proud of, others will notice. We'll be right back after a quick break with more of my conversation with Christian Palmaz. Bow Lake Kim, rocky shore. I will return once more. Yes, I will. Boom, diddy, boom, boom. Boom, diddy, boom, boom, boom. All right. The world's most beautiful paddle boards. Bow Lake. The water is calling. We're back with more from Christian Palmaz. 
In 2016, you wanted to return to your family ranching roots in Argentina, and your family purchased a nearby historic ranch that dates back to California's gold rush days and expand into cattle operations, specifically Wagyu cows. In an article, you said, we decided to tackle the American beef concept, feeling that America was ready for a better option than what was currently available in craft luxury. So was expanding into the beef business something you and your family thought about for a while? No, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I don't think any of us were sitting around looking for something else to do. But, I, you know, we, we do spend, not many people know this, but we do spend a significant amount of time, you know, about three months a year down in South America. So, you know, originally we're, all, we're my family's from Argentina. We spend a lot of time uh, down there. And, you know, if you know anything about an Argent, Argentinians or a lot of South Americans is, boy, do they love beef and they love yeah. barbecue. It really defines a lot of the cuisine down there. Uh, this very much uh, kind of uh, at the table and around the fire, you know, this, this kind of, it's almost a way of life. Um, and, you know, going to the local uh, butcher and picking up what you're going to cook that, that weekend, um, the experience is completely different than I think what most uh, what most of us see here in the United States. Imagine if you bought beef the same way you buy wine, in the sense that you not only know where it came from, but you know who's behind it, and you know uh, this a little bit about the season, and you know about you know. Imagine none of us think about this, but you know, imagine if there was a terroir of beef, imagine if, if, if the cow that, you know, gave its life to, uh, for us to have an incredible meal, uh, you know, if you, if you knew a little bit about that cow's life and the way it lived and what it ate and, and, and how it was raised and, um, and, and, you know, that is, is quite commonplace because in South America, we really tie a lot of, the animal to the place it comes from these estancias these spectacular estates that that are you know dedicate to to raising a very high quality uh beef and it's done at all levels right it's done at at, at all price points not just in the super high luxury and so the other thing that we noticed is is it's the way we cook um and 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 you know the the a butcher approach the kind of um anonymous uh, approach to buying, you know, uh, beef here at your local grocery store is we oftentimes go to the grocery store and we purchase sort of, uh, you know, six New York strips or six tomahawks or, you know, we'll buy, we'll buy multiples of, of one thing, uh, oftentimes with very little variety, right? Americans are very, uh, uh, we love the steak. And if you think about, you know, if every American had like a, a short course in understanding uh, the butchering of an animal and how how many of that cut at one animal gives, I think you, you, everybody would be so surprised of how many animals it takes to actually offer that and how, uh, you know, seemingly unsustainable it all can quickly become when you have, you know, a grass-fed cow that then gets transferred to a feedlot that then has to, you know, go on to make many, many different products. Um, I think it it would really change. And I think out of necessity, a lot of these countries in South America have have developed a culture around the cuisine of one cow feeds a village, uh, you know, feeds feeds a lot of people. And and so the way that we approach, you know, going to the butcher store is you, you, you know, you know, oh, we just we just butchered this cow from from this ranch. Uh, here's what, you know, here's what it yielded. Look at the incredible marbling on this, you know, on this cut, but you're leaving that day with a lot of different cuts and, and you're going to sort of celebrate that one animal uh, and it's going to give a lot and, and, and it goes off to produce obviously an incredible event and, and make a lot of people very happy. So we wanted to, I don't know, take a, take a shot at that, see if something like that could work here. Um, and so, yeah, we found this incredible piece of property uh, up in the high Sierras called the Genesee Valley Ranch, a very historic ranching uh, uh, environment that's, like you said, been around since the gold rush. It was started by a man named Edwin Hosselkus in the late 1800s, who never got into the 
the the gold frenzy himself, but probably wisely decided to support the gold rush era uh, by providing supplies and materials and food and beef and became a productive ranch. Um, and it's a very amazing story, but we're, we're the th only the third owners since that era. And uh, the ranch has been able to stay um, uh, contiguous and, 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 and together throughout all this time. And so we approach this by starting this in really exquisite purebred Wagyu cow. The Wagyu cows, not just because the beef is amazing, but the, the Wagyu cows, which come from you know high altitude Kobe, Japan, are actually acclimated to, to survive four seasons quite well. They have the right coats. They, they are, they're very, very hardy animals, and they do well in the snow. Uh, and, and so that, you know, of course, being in the high Sierras, that's what you have. You have four seasons. Um, and, and this property has a diversified, uh, amount of natural grasses. So they're not cultivated. They're not seeded. These are actual natural native grasses is about four, was about six or seven different species, but there's an, an incredible abundance of them. And so, uh, it's a fully grass fed product, but it is achieving, uh, you know, what you expect from the most exquisite, you know, Kobe beef out of Japan and the, you know, graded on the, uh, A3, A4, A5 scale, right? So a really unique product. What experiences did you leverage from owning a winery and caring for vineyards and the advanced technology you brought to the Valley to raise, harvest, and sell your grass-fed Wagyu beef? Well, I think it, it came a lot from that approach. I, you know, I think that vision, um, of, of allowing the customers to sort of be a part of a, a more sustainable approach of, of not just, you know, enjoying an absolutely exquisite top level uh, beef product, but also knowing that it's coming, you know, where it's coming from, the sustainable nature of the way it is, it is grown and everything behind uh, this process. And, and, you know, we know, we know that we know how to speak to that because we do that every single day with wines. Um, you know, we celebrate a product that comes from a place. Well, this is the same. It's the same concept. It's it's not anonymously sent into the the wholesale beef program. This is sold direct to consumer. And when you do that, you get to do some things you you know you don't normally get to share with the 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 greater uh, you know wholesale consumer base, which is you know there there are cuts the animal has that there may only be one of right and and. Uh, and so being able to work with a smaller group, a smaller audience, you can do some pretty exquisite things. Um, to the technology, you know, a lot of our, we basically developed a tool, uh, which was Vigor for grasslands. And so we worked with, we worked with our uh, optical um, partners that provide the imagery from the airplanes. And we were able to study the, uh, the grasslands in the similar way we study vines. In this case, not because we're going to, modify irrigation, but what we were going to do is change when we pull the cows from a certain area. So left, the cows will either trample or eat the grass to, to the nubs. Uh, and you don't want to do that, particularly with native grasses that, that you expect to regenerate. So you, you, we kind of need to pull the cows off of a certain area sooner than it, it may appear. It, it almost appears uh, like there's still a lot more grass to grow, but you need to give the grass a chance to come back. And so the, the cows give a lot to the land because, you know, they're obviously, they're leaving behind uh, a lot of nutrients themselves. Uh, but then, you know, we need to have a rotation ability to move them to another part of, of, the, of the property. So you went with a D to C business model for your beef enterprise. How many people have a ranch subscription? I believe right now it's uh, just over 500, uh, which, is, which is a good size for, uh, for, you know, the current capacity uh, that we have. And so there's different levels of the membership. Some people uh, elect to receive what we call the whole cow membership, which I, I believe is uh, 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 six shipments per year. Uh, but there's there's the uh, amuse-bouche, <laughs> which is a, a smaller, <laughs> uh, I think it's only two shipments per year. But it's basically, you can buy a la carte, um, but we encourage people to explore the subscription model because it's a, it's a really, it's, a, it's like a curated way to uh, to enjoy what the animal has to offer, and it, there's some really spectacular things there. Uh, it's the it's the perfect thing for the for the ultimate foodie. You know, if you like cooking and you like you like grilling and 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 uh, and you like beef, this is 
this is pretty much the ultimate. Mostly U.S.-based members? Definitely, all U.S.-based. And the club membership model also extends to your wines. You also have a vineyard membership that allows subscribers early access to the wines. How many are dual members? Oh, significant portion. I would say the majority of the 500 members are in the Beef Club or in the wine program. Um, and so, yeah, so the wine program has been around longer, of course. It's, you know, it's been, it's been sort of the, the, the preferred way to enjoy the Palmas wines. Um, and, and, you know, so a lot of people belong to both, but it's, it's, uh, it's not a, a prerequisite. You, you can belong to one or the other. It's been shown that the wine business has a millennial problem. Aging baby boomers currently the prime market for wine are nearing retirement age, the time of life when consumerism typically declines. On the other side of the coin, millennials have given no indication that they are poised to step in. They buy much less wine than boomers, and it seems the wine industry hasn't done enough to entice them to become regular consumers. How do you think the wine industry and wineries can do a better job of marketing to millennials? Yeah, I think it's very brand specific. Um, I, I recently asked this question to our marketing director. Um, I, you know, I said, "What's the average age of of a Brasos member?" Right, uh, one of our club members. I was really surprised. It was forty three, which I thought oh. was quite young, uh, yeah. given our you know very high price point. Um, and so I, you know, I I, I too hear that. I, I've heard exactly what you've said, and and uh, but I have to say, in observation. You know, and, and you know, I'm an ops guy. I'm I'm not a marketing guru. I, I I I focus on this vintage, not the one that we're selling, right? But just walking around the wineries, you know, seeing the smiling faces in the tasting room, talking to people, uh, I'm surprised at, at the diversity of the age groups. Um, I think that it is it is challenging to to talk to uh you know to to millennials i i technically am one i was born in 84 um and i think i think what's unique about it, it, millennials and i think they get they get kind of an unfair bad rap and let me explain when i remember going as a kid you know going around with wineries uh with my parents um th you know their purchasing behavior was was very much surrounding the the trust in the brand in the sense that you know this brand is is exquisite because of their reputation in other words they earned that 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 sense of of quality uh and an almost unwavering uh trust um so reputation was very important to them uh, and I, and I, and, and of course reputation is is very very important and time you know yields that but I feel like you can't just hang everything on what you did in the past. Every year, you have to show an unwavering dedication to quality. And the end consumer, particularly the, the millennial, I think is the most educated, most inquisitive uh, consumer that the wine industry has ever worked with. And what that means is that they want to be their own judge. And I think that's actually really good for us. It's very healthy. Uh, you know, we're an industry that, you know, as you said, very entrenched in tradition. And a lot of our traditions are based on uh, sort of this uh, black box approach to, to our products, right? They're exquisite. Don't ask why. They're just fantastic. You know, they are what they are. Uh, you know, you don't need to worry why this vintage is better than this vintage. It's just because we say so. The right. wine industry has been able to tell that narrative for a very long time. And I think the millennials are the first generation that, that it sort of said, yeah, I love it. Great. But tell me more. Tell me why. Why is this so good? Or why is this vintage different? And I think they really appreciate being explained, um, not being told in the marketing material. And so I think that the, the data heavy data analytics approach that, that, that we bring very, you know, if you spend some time on our website, you can really deep dive into understanding uh, from a climate climate uh, based approach, from a, a geological based approach, from a winemaking based approach and understand why Tina decided to use this parcel more in this vintage than in this one. I think before we used to think, well, the end consumer A wouldn't care to know that, or uh, they didn't deserve to know that. And I think that's false, right? In my opinion, we should 
give the end consumer as much information as they wish to seek out. And, and I think that has resonated well with our, with our core base who uh, I think they, they view that as a sign of respect that they do have the ability and the knowledge and the willingness to teach themselves and go out and, and empower themselves with the knowledge to make better decisions on the wines they buy. Right. And I think that's, that's a unique thing about this, this generation that we're, you know, working with now. Uh, and I think wineries need to embrace that. So this past winter saw some wild weather in California. Although intense storms wreaked widespread damage across the state, the wet weather seemed like a boon for winemakers, who have endured three years of drought, extreme wildfires, and the spiraling doom loop of climate change. Then, the novelty of an historic snowfall in February. Many winemakers were kind of praying for this. Was there a celebration at Palma's Vineyards? Absolutely. We, 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 we love the, the, the rains coming back. And honestly, it couldn't have been better. You know, it would be different if, you know, here we are April 27th. If we, you know, if we were receiving that much rain, if we had those atmospheric rivers hitting us now and, and we were saturating the soils that much, uh, it, it may, it, I would say it could definitely affect bud break. It could definitely affect the the beginning of of you know of of the growing season but we received the rain in the best possible time right all in january a little bit in february uh yeah we received a lot of it but we needed it right i i you know measuring our wells um we're 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 back to uh levels i hadn't seen for for 12 13 years so you know this is this was the shot in the arm i think you know the the water table needed uh, and i hope it happens again you know, now now they're they're talking long term predictions about it being an El Nino year. Again, that's good for us. We, you know, it's another higher higher uh, uh, per percentage opportunity for another wet winter coming here in the 24, 20, uh, you know, twenty end of twenty three twenty four winter, uh, which which again we need. Yes, it's going to change a little bit the strategy, right? You know, maybe we're not going to get this unlimited fourth quarter, just hang the fruit as long as you want. We may need to go back and open up our playbooks from 2009, right? 2011, those years where maybe 2013, a little cooler, you know, maybe we need to rethink things a little bit. Uh, you know, we've been enjoying these unlimited 280 day growing seasons, you know, hang it as long as you want, develop the fruit as long as you want, but it all comes down to do you have the water? And, you know, we, we, you know, we're very, very conscientious about water usage in Napa. It's, you hear it every single day, every winery you visit, you, you hear how people are worried about water. Um, and, and, you know, it's important. So we should be all doing the rain dance. And I think it's, <laughs> it's good for us. Yes. It's a double-edged sword. Yes. You know, it, it can make our growing seasons a little bit shorter, you know, you know, yes, more to more vegetation, but California is getting smarter about not just the water usage, but also the vegetation management, right? So we don't get ourselves into these, you know, explosive fires. Uh, so I see everything going the right direction. And absolutely, I celebrated uh, every minute that it rained this winter. We can't talk about wine growing and winemaking without talking about climate change. When did you and your family begin to realize that climate change was actually having an impact on your work as a winemaker? You, you know, uh, you can't work in agriculture and not, you know, talk about, <laughs> know and understand climate. Uh, you know, it is, it is absolutely ingrained in every kind of agriculture, especially in California. Um, you know, we we have the privilege privilege of working with uh, some fantastic uh, meteorologists uh, who we 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 consult with on on a uh, typically a biannual basis, uh, typically at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. You know, we'll we'll sit down with them, and what we're looking at is long term forecasts. But we also is we go back in time and we we look at patterns that were similar to this, and. We, we look at trends and, you know, because a lot of the behavior in, in the, 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 the sustainable actions that you're doing today may feel sustainable, but on a 50, 100 year scale may no longer be sustainable, if that makes sense. So, you know, fortunately, uh, we have the, the benefit of historic information and, you know, Napa Valley has really, really good records uh, going back 
about a hundred years. Uh, before then, you, you're getting into uh, kind of a different era of record keeping. But, but for about a hundred years, we have daily uh, and sometimes better than daily uh, record keeping on on areas and 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 observations made very close near here to the property. Now today, of course, we have three METAR stations. We measure everything you can possibly ima imagine from barometric pressure to solar radiation received at, you know, all this incredible amount of data. Um, but correlating that to previous eras, you know, the past can teach you lessons about the future. And so I, I think, you know, we, we, we look to the future and, 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 and you have to remember that global phenomenon occurring on a global scale uh, are are sometimes you know or, or, or seldomly seen in a in a kind of macro level environment that is Napa Valley, and so these microclimate environments you know as you study them and try to then adapt them to a microclimate environment around the you know the vines you're farming, uh, things don't always correlate right uh, you know so for example in the last you know 15 years we've actually seen an overall cooling trend in Coombsville. Um, now, of course, that doesn't jive with maybe what's happening in, you know, oceanic temperatures in the Pacific, for example, which obviously drive a lot of the, the, the weather and some of the, the, the phenomenon that we see here on the West Coast. Everything's connected, right? But you, you know, we live in a in a very small piece of the, of the globe, and we are farming in a very small piece of the of the weather phenomenon that occurs here in Napa Valley. So it's really important to understand the future. But I think the key is to look to the past and, you know, looking back, even just, you don't have to look that far, you know, just a few decades and you can see patterns that have emerged before that can help us pre better prepare for, for what's coming. As talented a winemaker as you and your family are, this is not entirely in your control. So might there be a day when you say, you know what, this is what Palma's cabs are going to taste like now. I think um, a big the big key to, to that statement has a lot to do with access to water. Um, a big part of why I think our wines have been successful every single vintage, uh, not to say that they don't have personality. Every winery has a, an, an indemnal touch from nature that, you know, the vintage puts us a spin on every vintage and you, you, you not only should accept that you should celebrate that, right? That's what makes uh, a vintage wine. So, so wonderful, the personalities of that vintage, but the quality and ensuring that, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, I had to rescale our high temperatures because we actually got, you know, I think it was one day we, we, we saw almost 110 degrees Fahrenheit as a high, right? Well, you know, my, my scales only go up to hundred for right. most years. So how do you survive that? How do you ensure, well, water, you got to give the vines, you have to control their stress periods, right? So you, you know, we, we do these cyclical stress periods on the vines that gets them through the growing season. And if you don't have access to water, you're going to get outside the healthy range of, of what's acceptable for the vine and the fruit will shrivel. The flavors will will suffer and the the wine will ultimately be worse. And so access to water is everything. So so this is why, you know, I think back in, you know, to in 1999 when when we began construction and and, and developing the winery. I mean, people thought we were absolutely crazy to put in this enormous water treatment system. Um and and I got to tell you, you know, having an additional 1.7 million gallons of water at your at your fingertips to help get you through, uh, you know, and yes, the property we're very fortunate we have a lot of water sources here, but what what may happen in a hundred years or fifty years even, uh, it, it's difficult to know. But what I do know is that we're being careful with the water we have, and I think that attitude and that that approach to just because you have it, use it, um, is, is what's going to ultimately help us retain the qualities of the wines that I think people come to expect from us. And I think that's the ace up our sleeve is that, is that access to water is very, very important. So what can we expect from Palma's vineyards in the near future? I think you know uh, it's 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 been a real interesting era. I think we're we're, we're stepping into um, you know ten years ago we were uh, really 
you know, innovating at this sort of uh, breakneck pace of of creating new tools. Every every you know, we seem to be challenging every uh, piece of the of the puzzle here. Um, now we've Im- implemented some some spectacular tools. I, f- I feel like we're in this era of refinement now. Still innovating and, and trying new ideas. You know, now we're 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 trying this new uh, robotics application in the vineyard uh, to maybe instead of taking pictures from a plane, but actually do them by these uh, battery powered robots. Uh, it, you know that that can roam the vineyard at night and, and and use better light sources and have more higher resolution imagery of the vine. I mean, all these cool ideas. Um, but believe it or not, they feel like refinements from the overall uh, thought ten years ago of. Should let's should we even bother taking pictures of vines? So, so now we've accepted that this is the way of life. This is the way we approach wine. Uh, uh, this innovation first, uh, you know, art first concept, and and you know, I, I feel like I'm very excited about the things that are in the pipeline, and I feel like the next ten years we're just going to get better and better. So my final question, Christian, is the luxury item question, which I ask all my guests. So if you were stranded on a deserted island. And you can only have one luxury item with you. What would that luxury item be? It can't be any form of air or water transportation to get you off that island or anything that requires mobile service so you can call somebody to get you off that island. What would that one single luxury item you would like to have with you? Well, for me, honestly, after doing that dinner a couple of weeks ago, it'd be another <laughs> bottle of the 2003. <laughs> That would do it. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out the rest later. Hopefully someone's coming to help. But yeah, in the meantime, another bottle of 03. I'll take that any day. Christian Palmaz, Chief Operating Officer of Palmaz Vineyards. Thank you so much for joining me on The Luxury Item. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of The Luxury Item Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful and entertaining, I would be really grateful if you can share it with a friend or colleague. I would love it if you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. The Luxury Item Podcast is a production of Silvertone Consulting. I'm your host, Scott Kerr. Until next time.